Hello and welcome to episode 35 of Something Inventive. In this show, we'll be looking at uh, what your website needs to be legal and we'll be talking about copyright law. So we've got lots of interesting things to look at. We've also got a guest, Sarah Dixon, who you can see there. Uh, we'll get to her in a minute. Just a little bit of follow-up first. I forgot to mention on the last podcast episode with Jonathan Pollinger, but I met up with Carl, Dean and Steve from the Mac and Forth podcast in London at the Craft Beer Rising Festival, which was ooh, back in Feb 23rd now. And it was great. I've not been to a proper beer festival before and it was uh, awesome. I, I really liked it. I was introduced to a gingerbread milk stout uh, by Steve, which I really, really liked. And Elvis Juice, I think Dean uh, introduced me to that. Both absolutely lovely, lovely, lovely beers. Uh, I'm not a particularly beer fanatic but uh, it was really nice had a great day really nice to meet up with those uh, those guys and you can go and check out our podcast it's the uh, mac and forth podcast you can find that on all the good players but it was particularly nice as well because i used to live in london in spitalfields and this was all held at the truman brewery which is down along brick lane so it's really nice to go back there go to the 24-hour bagel shop to relive my youth um anyway on to our guest uh, sarah dixon she's from the contract store and uh, spider creative Sarah, just introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you do. So Spider Creative is, uh, I basically help people with their digital communication strategies. That covers a lot of ground. I started as building websites for people a long time ago, and it has evolved into supporting people to get online, use social media effectively, find out if they should be on podcasts you know, make, Absolutely. make a really holistic plan that fits into their business overall in a really meaningful way so that it's efficient and you get good flow of um, people through your business. And with Contract Store, I've been working for a long time. So that's a family business. That's my dad that set it up. Contract Store provides uh, ready-made legal contracts of all kinds, including notices for your website and things like that. Very simple, small things, um, up to kind of agency agreements to appoint people in China to manufacture for you and all kinds of different agreements that you can use ready to go. The idea is you download, you tweak them, and you might take them to a lawyer just to, to finish them off, but you save a lot of the legal expense by having something that's 80 to 90 percent there. Yeah, it's a really nice idea. I mean, you're just down the road from us in Stroudway. And I think, how do we meet? Meeting over, a, I think, a client of yours at the time. We got in touch and talked about Contract Store, which is a great really good idea for us we're often looking for or our clients are needing stuff yeah. for their website which is partly what we're going to talk about today and sometimes going to solicitor i think if the case is a little odd your terms need are very specific or different mm -hmm. from anyone else then yeah sure you need a specialist to look at that but i think that's in right. a lot of cases you can just use something that's uh, pre-written it's a great way to educate yourself as well to understand what you might want to think about if you are going into a new deal yeah that's true actually yeah very so good point quite a nice education educational process there are lots of things that when we're building a website i'm sure you you're the same there are lots of things that need to be in place on a website now i'm i'm aware of a few of them like making sure the, the legal name needs to be on the website somewhere that maybe you've got some kind of terms and conditions certainly with gdpr that changed things a little bit but i'm a little woolly as to exactly what should be on there so i'm hoping you can shed light on this so there are different regulations that cover this and that's why it gets messy and woolly and confusing on the contracts or website the document called website and email legal notices that kind of summarizes it and each document comes with a lot of explanatory notes so you'll find a lot of information if you scroll down the product okay so let's go and have a look at that I'll, I'll find that on my screen so we can have a look at that and basically like you've just mentioned you do have to put your company name where it's registered and this covers sole traders as well as um like limited companies a registered office address mm -hmm. so you have to have some kind of physical address some kind of email contact so that people can contact you mm -hmm. and uh, basically who you are <clears throat> excuse me and so if you're a charity or, or a CIC or anything like that, you still need to put those pieces of uh, information up publicly so that people can recognize you are. It's kind of the equivalent of a letterhead, you know, yeah. that in the past you would have to put certain information about your business just so that people know who they're dealing with. That's the point. Do you have to put them on every page or just one page on the site? How clear do they need no, to be? They can just be on the about page, something like that. Um, but very commonly people will pop it into the footer so that it's readily, readily available across the whole site. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people either just forget or don't really know how much to put in and they might put something a little sketchy and they might not make an email address available because that's um, then subject to getting collected by spam box. Yeah. So it's kind of annoying to have to do that. <clears throat> you can put it in an image or write it out as an, an AT instead of um, putting the at sign and all that. So there are ways around, which I'm sure Ben and other web, your web developer will be able to advise you. Technically, you are, you are meant to put contact information. Mm. Um, you have to put a telephone number because I 
see a, there's a lot of places, maybe mm. they're a small store, they're running it on the side and mm. they don't have a telephone number on there. Is that important or it just has to be some sort of contact detail? Basically, under the electronic commerce regulations, you have to have your business name, a geographical address mm -hmm. and your email address. Okay. Don't have to put a phone number. So this is also interesting of how the legislation is trying to cope with the Internet and what people just are doing on the Internet. So the legislation is like trying to keep up with how people <laughs> yeah. are behaving in this new world. So sometimes the law and the internet kind of don't quite make sense together. I know because it became quite difficult if you're if you're running a store on the side. I know we've got a couple of clients who do this and they're working from home, but they don't really want to share their home address on there, but they have to put yeah, the, the exactly. address. Yeah, and it, that can be difficult. Is there any way around that? Is there a way that you can buy a PO address on there or another? If you put a PO box number or if you register your company in a different location, you might be able to do it through a co-working space possibly. Right. Or, you know, there are other ways it it could be that you work with your web developer and a bit like they, they might host your site for you. They might also be willing to host your kind of official address. Oh, there's a um, money making opportunity. <laughs> well, I think possibly. And, and you know, there are, we need to be a little maybe imaginative. But basically, the point is that the, the public need to be able to see where you are, who, who you are. Yeah. So if you are at home, you could put, possibly put like the street name, but you don't put the full. Th mm, I'm not sure. I mean, that is a really tricky one, actually. Make sure that you're complying to the point of having a, a specific address. You are going to have to get registered with some kind of official post postal location. But I do get the unease with putting some of that stuff out there, like mm. I said, with the email as well. It's that's probably the reason a lot of people don't do it automatically, even even if they know they're meant to. And a lot of people don't even know that. So um, obviously, once you start trying trading online, then all this stuff really does have to get quite serious and you must do it. Yeah. So as an example there, um, let, well, let's take two two examples and we'll work, work, work through them. So we've got just a regular business. They've got these basic details on their website. What about yeah. terms and conditions? Is that something that people need to have on their website, their terms of trade? It depends on the business. So if you're trading online and selling from your website, yes, you must. Put, uh, quite a lot of information about how you're going to give refunds you know what are the delivery times and prices and all this kind of stuff but if you are not trading directly from your website you can deal with your terms and conditions more privately by email so after somebody's got in touch with you and you end you're entering into that agreement with them you can you can do it offline okay it could be just useful to do that so that people can check that out before they start in a relationship with you and they've got a clarity around that it also saves a bit of time, like you can just send them the link to your website yeah, exactly. conditions instead of having to bespoke, like send a custom email each time. So it's kind of, yeah, you don't have to put them up unless you are trading from your site. Now with privacy, that's slightly different. So anything where you're collecting user data, um, such as forms or cookies, I mean, that is much more strict now with GDPR. What do we have to put in? What do we have to make sure we're doing that? Well, the first step actually is to do a kind of audit of what data you're collecting. And when you collect data about people, and this is this is referring specifically to personally identifiable data. So mm. people's names, addresses, email and phone. And it could expand into healthcare and all sorts of other scenarios. But it identifies that person in some way. Then you need to basically justify why you're collecting it, where you're storing it, how well you're looking after it and how can you cope with it if somebody says they want to be deleted off your systems so those are the responsibilities you have if you start storing information about people mm -hmm. and this is good for the individual because it means we can now ask facebook to completely erase all our data which we couldn't do before and it you would you would think that they would do that as well although there's been a lot of um no. controversy that they haven't been doing that it's very tricky because they store the information they remove it publicly but they don't necessarily delete it off their actual computers yeah. and then you've got with larger companies you know many layers of backup going on yeah so if you've yeah, got true. several layers of backup you have to factor that into your data handling you might think i've deleted it from the front layer but the backup from three months ago is still storing it yeah that's true we've we've got a couple of clients yeah. um with with uh, maybe an e-commerce website well uh, let's say they've got a daily backup that, that rolls over 30 days. So mm. um, you're going to have to wait for 30 days for that personal detail to, to roll out. They do allow some time for you to deal with the data. Yeah. So you can say in your policy, like within 30 days or 60 days, we will make sure it's deleted. So you don't have to do it instantly, but you do have to be able to identify where that data is and make sure it can be deleted or changed or moved to another provider. Yeah. Um, when people are confronted with GDPR, I would say start with an audit. So figure out what data you're collecting, make a little chart 
and um, and write down where it's stored. And then at least you've shown that you've started the process. So if there was a problem, you can say, well, I did do an audit and, you know, I'm, an, I'm, I'm trying to sort this out. It is a lot of kind of admin, basically. And again, on contract store, there's a free like audit form. You can download a, a spreadsheet and use that as your ah, guideline. Let me see if I can find that. In there, there is a free mini course if you need to take it seriously and you can follow some emails which will take you through the whole process. I will pop that in later. Yeah. If you have a look there, the second item, the data collection table. So if you if you get hold of that, it's talked about in the course actually and it shows you how to fill it in, but it's, pre it's fairly self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. you, you just need to show willing that you are starting to think about what data. The other point to make with small businesses is that you're probably using something like ConvertKit or MailChimp or those kind of email mm -hmm. handlers. You might be using PayPal or Stripe. You've got all these turn of third party softwares that are handling data on your behalf so in your policy you don't have to give detailed explanations of what MailChimp is doing with their email address you just say I'm using MailChimp here's the link to their terms right so you just need to be transparent about the data systems that you're using and then you can let the user decide if they're okay with you using MailChimp to store their stuff and that means it's not on your system you have a bit less responsibility there you're handing it over to MailChimp yeah something we do on that front is to just mention that I mean it's in our uh, privacy policies but to mention that what software we're using so I think for example in our sign up for our newsletter we've got mm. a little bit of text at the bottom which uh, says that you should know that we use Campaign Monitor to deliver the newsletter and gather statistics. So we're just telling them upfront, not in the policy, uh, well, it's in the policy, but it's upfront yeah. exactly what we're doing with that data at that time and, and why we need it. I mean, it helps improve the newsletter. It is true. We do use it for that because we like to know what people are clicking on, what they're interested in reading. I think it's useful for people to see the data is going. I personally find it just interesting to see what data processing companies are using. That's the um, really good practice you've got there because you've made it really clear and easy for people to see. The whole point of this legislation is to make us have more control yeah. over how our information is used by other people, particularly commercial companies. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's actually a kind of, it is a bit of a chore, but it's also got an upside, which is that we have a little more consciousness about what we're getting involved in when we go on the internet. Yeah, and I, I only think it's a chore in so much that, that it's a change to our normal practice. I think once it's baked in, you start thinking like that. And that's the point, isn't it? That they get people to think like that whenever you're putting location out or you're collecting data that you start thinking about it from the, your customer or potential customer's point of view or any in fact anyone who's interacting with it we've come across something i mean related to gdpr really we across all our clients we implemented uh, a, a new cookie policy which blocked google analytics by default so if they visited the site for the first time it would block google analytics mm -hmm. so so that's a, a first page visit would not be tracked if they then right. viewed the page uh, viewed a second page or continue to to scroll the page then it would pa passively uh, agree to that cookie policy which is allowed in in the ico especially for something that isn't tracking them personally with uh, personal identifiable information exactly. Exactly. If it's not personally identifiable, then it's fine. It's not GDPR. Yes. However, we came across uh, an odd issue, which I didn't realize until later. As we started looking at our, our clients' statistics, we noticed a lot of direct traffic. Direct traffic was really high, high and organic. And I thought, that's that's just odd. Looking into it, and it makes sense now, what's happening is you're getting visits coming in. And if they're new visits, they come to the site and all cookies are blocked yeah. until it refreshes. And then it, all referral data has been abandoned and it's refreshing yeah. on that page and it looks like they've just come to your page directly and it's like oh it's so frustrating <laughs> Because you can only tell the source of people if they've already visited your website, which is not what you want. I need to look at implementing something where it just allows or see how, how if we can allow Google to go through uh, Google Analytics to be flagged for that first time. As long as it's not doing any advertising, uh, demographic information or collecting any any personal identification mm -hmm. in any way. So until we, we can really restrict that down, I don't want to change it. But it's really frustrating because it affects, it affects lots of different things. Anyway, back to... Uh, uh, back to uh, everything else we need so we were talking about personal information is there anything else really that we need to make sure is on a website yeah you have to have the privacy policy up and there is a little thing about like if you're registered with any professional bodies so that kind of goes with the whole thing of who you are mm -hmm. and how can people trace you if they've got a problem or whatever mm -hmm. 
to be a trackable, real, identifiable company. You do have to do all this cookie notice stuff now because of the GDPR, so people need to know that you're collecting data. Um, but yeah, that pretty much covers it. The optional areas are things like a copyright notice. Mm -hmm. Your terms and conditions you must share if you're trading off your website. So there's that does get quite complicated in some ways, usually fairly standard. And if you use a platform like Shopify, they're all built in. Yeah. But you still, or Etsy or anything like that, so but you still have to go through and make sure that you you actually can comply with those and tweak them if your terms are different. That's right. Yeah. You can't just rely on what they've said because it may not be exactly your practice. Yeah. Exactly. And you might choose to change it or you might have a product that doesn't fall into the standard categories mm. or something like that. Yeah. You, if you're trading online, you really must start to take this quite seriously and, and really look through the, the nitty gritty of those terms and make sure that they're available to people. And I know we, we've talked um, offline before that you've got all these standard uh, policies that can be bought and downloaded on your website here. But what if you need to have have them customized or, or just checked over while you've made it as simple as possible to read through and understand how do I know that it actually reflects my business yeah so you can bring your document to contract store for a checking service you can also take it to any lawyer and just say this is the basic that I'm working with can you just check it for me the, they're written in a relatively unlegal language very straightforward as possible while still being you know legally correct generally you should be able to see in there yourself Mm -hmm. if it is to match your circumstances and then if you're not sure then absolutely come back to contract store or go and talk to a lawyer and make sure that you are really happy that you've not left anything or put anything slightly off that isn't really right for you but generally by reading it you'll you'll get a really good sense of whether this is a good fit or not and you can see that a lot of detailed notes before you buy it as well so you can even do that before you even download it. it's a shame that not all um, people do this I, I heard in the news about um was it a shipping contract where they they're taking the terms and conditions from yeah I, i'm guessing is it a pizza store or something like that uh, they're just taking it from somewhere else which did not apply to their particular business and they just yeah they just copied and pasted and loads of people copy and paste their terms from somewhere else yeah. it's not great i mean that was a really good example of a very poor practice they didn't even bother to check that it was a pizza company and they should remove those words yeah exactly you'd imagine if someone it it somewhere no. you'd check through it <laughs> What it boils down to is you're writing out how you're going to do business, what commitments you make to your customers, what they are expected to do in return, pay you, yeah. maybe on time, things like that. It's just a way of writing down what it is you both think is going on. So yeah, in theory, you can just copy and paste and then tweak and make it so. But if you get a well-written one that's made deliberately generic so that you fill in the details it's just going to save you hassle it's going to be smoother and cleaner and nicer and it really isn't a big investment just to get that chore kind of accelerated forward I do recommend to my clients to do this properly because it's like setting up your hosting and you just want to get all the groundwork really good and solid and you don't want to be leaving yourself exposed to problems because the, the ultimate outcome is you get sued or you have some kind of dispute that drains your business yeah so to avoid that have really decent terms and make them available and you are protecting your business basically yeah and and they're not they're not expensive i'm i mean uh, you can get packs on your site but usually they range about 20 to 30 pounds per document yeah so it's, it's not a huge deal i i know that a solicitor is going to charge you um I, I'm guessing about a thousand pounds, maybe slightly under that for some basic terms and conditions. And and as uh, I think we were speaking before about this, they're going to be having a pro forma document that they'll work from anyway. So they'll take that off the shelf, so to speak, and they will run through it and customize it for you. So you're paying for their, obviously looking over their expertise in it, but effectively they're doing the same thing. So this is a good way to, to get up to speed first. That's how this business started. Giles is a lawyer and he said, we're all just using these templates and then charging people loads of money to tweak them. Why don't we just put the templates out and then you just pay for the tweaking part if you need it. Yeah. You may not need it. OK, so let's move over to the sponsor, which is Inventive People. Um, so most business owners just need a little help getting stuff done in their business, such as bookkeeping, call answering, legal, getting legal documents written and, and of course, marketing. So really, you want to focus on what makes you money and, and what you enjoy. So we've launched a service called Inventive People just to do that very thing. It's an awesome collective of creative, technical and marketing people ready to help you with the most common marketing and promotional tasks. We're also speaking with um, Sarah, see if we can integrate some of the legal documents in there as well, but that will be coming soon. If you need a blog article written, a website updated, some new staff photos, 
our case study video, then go to inventivepeople.co.uk and you can get that done. So we'll take an example here under web design. So if we just click on that, we can see we've got various different options. And actually, if we've got a hacked site, then we can go straight into this. We can buy that um, online straight away. And we know our website isn't complex, so we can stand that to the cart, buy it, and then we'll get in touch to get that sorted for you and clean up your website. But there's lots of other things on here from content writing through to video production as well. And very simple, you can buy those tasks. If um, you're listening to this podcast, and I know you are because you're listening right now, then you get 20% off your first order with discount code Inventive Podcast. All you need to do is just add that into checkout at the end and you'll get it straight away. No problem at all. So I'm just going to do that to show you. Pop that code in and we've got a discount of £76. Okay, moving on. Let me find out where my... Okay, moving on. Let's get to um, another topic I want to touch on, which is related to um, legal, what your website needs to be legal, is copyright law, specifically for media. Now, I know, Sarah, you're not an expert in this, but I wanted to touch upon it. So, because I know a lot of our clients, and you probably have this too with your marketing clients, is that there's a lot of media involved, a lot of images, music, and video that people want to include or mash together in various different forms. And I know a couple of our clients who've sort of solicited this material on their own got into hot water over some of this. I know recently a client was contacted by HMRC asking them to take down an image that was used in one of their blog posts. It was just a HMRC logo. There was no legal action involved. It was just uh, uh, just a takedown notice, just to get rid of it. Uh, there would have been legal action had that continued. I know that image libraries like Getty have got in contact with a client, sent through a nice letter saying you owe us £600 for the use of this little tiny image that's on your website. And I think if you leave that, they come, they'll come, they come back with a discount or an offer for that image if you get in touch with them. But if you leave it, they will just run that through their legal process. And I'd imagine it's all it's all very standard tick box exercise for them. But there's no need to get into hot water over that. You know, either you should look to make sure you purchase the image up front or um, find free places to to get that sort of media. What's your thoughts on that, Sarah? How do you manage that with your clients? I do like to encourage people to get their own images. Quite often, you maybe can book a photographer and get a set taken from within your business. Mm -hmm. And it's not just for protecting yourself legally, but it also gives that unique flavor. So it's more authentic expression of your business. Yes. And so depending on what you're doing, stock images aren't always the best choice anyway. But yeah, if you are gonna do that, and it does save a bit of time, although over the long term, it's quite good to have a bank of pictures of your own that you can use. You can go to various, there's all sorts of, I'm sure you're gonna share the links. I do have a scene, yeah. Pixabay, Unsplash. Now always check, there'll always be licensing information on those kind of sites. So just double check that it's okay to be commercial. Often they'd like you, if not demand, that you give attribution. And that again, it's just good practice. It's just polite to say, this guy took this picture. Thank you, you know. Yeah, it, um, it, is, a nice thing. it is a nice thing to do because they've, uh, they've taken their time to produce this creative work. They may have uh, photoshopped it or edited it afterwards to make it look great and they're yeah. allowing it to be freely used. Exactly, so you know, it's great that we can have all these free images. It's also not so great if you're a photographer and you're, you've got to, you know, that's your trade. So it's only fair to at least acknowledge them. Most of the free sites do request that. I think a lot of them don't enforce it. So mm. there are safe places to get beautiful free images. Flickr you've added as well, I think, which is a, another good one. You can search by license. It's gonna show how that works. So if we if we, yeah. if we search for cats up here, and um, we get some lovely pictures of cats, and there's, there's lots of images here, a lot of people might just go straight to using one of these images. So pick on this one here. You've got the cat pictures in. And this one, we're, we're looking through and it goes, um, someone might just use that, download it and use it straight away. But if we notice, it says all rights reserved down here, yeah. which means That's you cool. can't use it without their permission. So. You may just be able to ask for permission. They say, sure, no problem. Use my cat photo. Just give me credit. Or they might say, I want payment for that. So it's really, I've certainly had clients come to me when they've got things from Google search. They've just typed in cats on Google search. Up it comes and they found an image, grab it. And it's from a Getty image library. Um, Google search is not the place. I would say top tip, do not use Google no. search to find those pictures. Go to an officially recognized free website, uh, free images site, and make sure that you're checking those licenses. That's right. An interesting point about Flickr is that Getty is mining Flickr for pictures. Oh, so if oh, you okay. nick a picture where it says all rights reserved, that probably means the user has allowed their pictures to be searched by Getty. So Getty can then resell them without really contacting the photographer. You, they'll just send them some money like they'll send they'll send them a notice if it sells mm -hmm. 
But they can make those photos from Flickr available through Getty, which is why you might have got a picture from Flickr and then it's Getty that's chasing you. Right. OK. So in this case, to be to be sure that's not going to happen, commercial use allowed option at the top. So once you've done your search, you've got a little drop down and then you can select different licenses there. Commercial use allowed, I think, is the safest one because they've explicitly said you can make money from it. I think to be safe, if you've got anything which is going out there, which is even the tinge of um, mm-hmm. making money or relating back to a business that makes money i'd make sure it's commercial use is allowed Absolutely. Uh, unless it, unless it's a, a free blog where you're just doing a satire of um things and it's totally personal it's better to make sure and that's going to cover all cases here and then if we take one of these as an example this silly cat here we should be able to see it says some rights reserved and you can click on that to find out exactly what you are free to do and generally right. if it's commercial then you're free to uh, change it adapt it transform it now usually it does say that you must give credit I usually just link through to the page so I'll link through to this page with that person's name so we know where it's come from and we know yeah. we give them credit and that you could put that as a bit of text down the bottom of the blog post however I I know that unless you're searching for something broad like cats, I mean, Flickr's going to really narrow down the amount of images you can uh, have on commercial use. So I've started using, if we're not um, getting them taken uh, through inventive people, or we've got another image library, which I'll show in a minute, but the Plexels and, what do they call? Pexels and Pixabay are two great sites that have a lot of um, free-to-use images on. So I was just going to run through another example with cats here. This is on Pexels.com. And so this, again, free use, you can download different sizes. Sometimes they require you to log in but you can check what your requirements are um where is it free to use so if we click on that it's going to give you what the requirements are so it's free to use for commercial purposes which is important it also says on here and these are two where i've started to notice they don't require credit which is interesting usually if it's yeah. free they say please, please give us a link or credit this doesn't require credit at all which is interesting yeah. um i always do give them credit because i think it's fair i don't see any reason why we shouldn't do that um certainly if i if, if it's possible to do that so this this is really good and there's there's tons of lovely images on here again if you start looking for specific things it's going to narrow down a lot general images the other one's pixabay pretty much the same same sort of setup here just search for birds no attribution required pretty much the same licenses as pexels i also want to share another um, image library that we use that tons of others i mean you've got shutterstock you've got iStock photo was it one two three rf is another one there are ones you can just pay small amounts of money as opposed to the really big budget images as libraries as well There's also this one I came across recently called Elements from Envato. Now Envato do lots of different stuff. They, Mm -hmm. they'll do WordPress themes, WordPress plugins, got Audio Jungle, which has a lot of audio um, samples and music. And they're basically with Envato Elements, they're kind of combining that all together in one searchable library. So um, with this, you actually pay a monthly fee. Let me find out how much it is. So you can pay £12.50 and you can get access to all of the different items available on here, like stock video, uh, music, graphics, like illustrations, templates, mm-hmm. and so on. But I use it a lot for video, um, sorry, audio and photos. They've got a pretty good selection on here. It's not bad. There's one difference on here that you have to abide by in that if we if we're using them as a creative and you probably have the same thing sarah if we're using them we can use them and mix them into the work for the client but the client can't then reuse that photo how they wish so Mm. we have to give them effectively our license to use it for that particular purpose so uh, we we could put it onto their website for them and then they can use that freely forever for as long as they like we can put it into a podcast recording or video for them and they can use that forever what they can't strictly do although i don't know how how it'd be monitored is then use that in lots of different forms um after they've stopped working with us so their license effectively is revoked from that point in new materials so i i I guess the issue there is just making sure that um, from that company's point of view because they're responsible for that copyright um infringement if they use this uh, picture of this uh, little golden retriever puppy in material on a new website that we didn't design for them and so our mm. license isn't passing through to them they've got to right. protect themselves effectively because they're responsible for that i guess generally it's not going to be an issue but it is something to for, for your client to know that they either need to sign up to Envato elements themselves if they don't use you anymore or they need to make sure that they're not reusing that in lots of different places you know it's, it's a small issue i think but it is important that sounds like more like a standard image library where you get you buy the image for a particular use and 
you pay more if you want a wider use and it's also dependent on audience size and things again it's a bit more traditional so i think the internet is maturing a little bit and we've got a way of coping with the free image side of things mm. and um, we've also got this new law coming in from the eu oh is this the article 13 one yeah okay. so that so it's it's about how you know when the internet started everyone just chucks all their stuff online and everyone's grabbing everything and and now it's more like wait a minute that's my copyright. I don't want you to use that to make money and so on, so on. And so the law is catching up and the systems are catching up. So we've got these amazing free websites where you know that it's safe. Yeah. And then you've got other sites where you just pay and have a more traditional licensing arrangement. And presumably the photographers finding their way and figuring out how to make this work for them as well. So hopefully it's progressing in a, in a way that allows everyone's businesses to work well. Yeah, I, I hope so. It's only fair that people get what they request from their material because they've created it. However easy it was for, for them to create it that's irrelevant they've created something and if you want to use it commercially then mm. you should either have to pay for it or license it in some way or agree to use it and so it's really nice when it is straightforward and you go to the website and it says you don't need to do these things sometimes yeah. i go i go there and you almost want to give them something for it because it's so good you often can a lot a bit like wikipedia a lot of those free websites there is a little thing by the by the photographer and a cup of coffee so you just ping them a couple of quid you know that's still a lot cheaper than an even a low-end limit image library so I do that occasionally. Yeah, I just send a few quid over there to those free sites just to keep those photographers happy because we need them happy, right? To keep feeding us yeah, with the great people. Absolutely. And it's just a few quid from you. But if everyone does that, that mounts up. And that, that's, yeah. um, I think, only fair. So let's just quickly dive into this Article 13 or Article 17. I, I get confused. It's, it's got different, different names. But I think it's known as Article 17, but formerly known as Article 13. Um, I'm just going to pop up on my screen um, an article which was about um, uh, a German protest. And I think this was a protest against this uh, EU law going through. And the EU, EU law is, uh, amongst other things, uh, and this is what the article, this part of the, this law going through, amongst other things, is trying to get uh, internet platforms like uh, YouTube, um, Facebook, to be responsible for any copyright infringement. That's, that's yeah. the way I read it. There is more to this law that's going through, and I haven't read into that, but it's just this specific part that's become uh, highlighted and uh, everyone's talking and shouting about. And, and as we discussed offline, I think getting the wrong end of the stick, maybe, or worrying about things that being a problem and, and they're not. I think one of the issues here was uh, people were worried that they would lose their freedom to satirize content. So there's a lot of memes that people like making. They'll take little clips from a video, turn it into a little animated GIF, or, or they'll put words over something because it's funny. I think that has always been your right in terms of copyright. If you are satirizing something, you can use that material to to do that as part of your satirical comment or picture or yeah. video you obviously have that's to be right. clear you couldn't just play the whole of star wars and, and just say well what, that, that's a bit rubbish isn't it i think you've got it's got to be it's got to be relevant um it's got to be good satire, right? yeah, exactly <laughs> oh, i don't know if quality comes into it actually. they've actually written in uh, an amendment to it to make sure that memes are specifically allowed so you could take a photo of someone that is um from a, a tv show and you can write your text over the top and you can share that with friends. That's totally allowed. Um, I think all of the, the usual ways that copyright, that copywritten material can be used are still okay. People were worried about that. The other thing that people were worried about is that in order to protect a company like YouTube is that they would have to put in place a content filter on the people uploading their content to protect them from an infringement before it gets out in, pub, in public. So rather than it, me uploading a video and then YouTube um, maybe checking the copyright of that over a period of time. That period before that's been checked, they would have infringed on that copyright, so therefore they're liable. So people are saying that they would have to filter that before it goes up, and that the problem with that, an algorithm that's looking at that copyrighted material, may look at something like a movie review, see some clips of a film that's being played in that movie review, and then would not allow it to be uploaded because it actually contains copyrighted material, even though that is allowed because they're you're allowed to talk about something in that way. And so that's what people are worried about. I think that's a lot mitigated now. Again, looking at the internet as opposed to what was before the internet um, and media companies, so newspaper publishers, for example, they can't just publish everybody's content. They they have 
a lot of responsibility of what goes into their newspaper. Yeah. But the argument that the internet companies have always made is like, oh, we're not publishers. We're just like kind of posting a thing and it's nothing to do with us. But actually this is pushing back and saying, no, they do have some responsibility for what's on their platform. Yeah, I think they were acting as, um, it all comes back a common carrier law, which was to do with railways or something like that. So railways were not responsible for the material they carried. They were just carrying it. And then that moved yeah. to tele telco networks where they're saying, it's not, we're not responsible for what we, people talk about. Internet, yeah. internet service providers, the same thing. I think when it starts getting to companies that are making money off that content that is viewed, so they're not just, right. they're not just a dumb pipe. They're not, it's not YouTube isn't just taking exactly. data from one place and poking it into another system. They're making money from it and advertising off the back of it. So they are publishers. And they're filtering it all the time yeah. and making a lot of decisions about who gets to see what. Yeah. So they absolutely are behaving more like a publisher. So yeah, it's an interesting sort of shift happening. It is good. Yeah. Um, and there's bound to be protests at each step. Well, and yeah, so, so the point of this particular article is that there were protests um, online and um, those protests were dismissed because they said they're all bots, you know, these are you know, just creating an army of bots to create all these protests online. And so um, a lot of people showed up to show we are not bots, we are real people um, that, yeah. and we want this discussed. And, you know, this is um, this shows the, the people in action actually do, doing what we, we want uh, to happen. Um, so it's just worth having a, a little read of this article. I'll make sure it's in the show notes. There's lots of videos about Article 13, 17. I think it's been voted on now. So whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But um, it's, it's interesting to read. Um, uh, about these uh, about what's going on mm -hmm. so just to finish off i just wanted to touch upon a couple of articles on our blog that are going out and a review that we've got as well a couple of articles i want to bring people's attention to is a really good interview i had with alex galvez um she is one of the top influencers on linkedin in the uk has been for a number of years who originally started a hashtag called authentic alex where she was talking about some of the problems that she was suffering with at work and how she's moved forward in that she's got a lot of uh, response online for that but also she uh, created this uh, linkedin local network which is uh, with uh, another woman who i can't remember her name but i'll see if i make sure her she's linked in the show notes as well uh, and so this LinkedIn local network is um, a way for people to meet up. So you might know each other on LinkedIn, but it's the way for have sort of friendly networking over drinks. And this, this is expanded throughout the world. So that's a fascinating uh, interview. And if you want to up your LinkedIn game, I would definitely recommend listening to it. Really, really good. Also, a brilliant article from uh, Lou. She's written about captivating your captive audience. And particularly, a couple of things here about looking for opportunities to sell more while your customer is with you. And what she's looking at in this article is just because you have a captive audience doesn't mean you need to rip them off. We've got a couple of examples there where we've been out to a racing track for our boys to go around on the carts and we've got rubbish coffee no bacon sandwich there. I mean, there's, there's a real opportunity to, to, to take more money from us, which we willingly give them if the quality is uh, right, but also to make our time better, to make our experience better. So that's a really good article. I recommend everyone have a look at. And also we got a lovely review on, um, on iTunes from John R. And he says, great podcast. Uh, I worked with a customer of Al and Ben's for years. Uh, their podcast is great and they taught me a lot. Great fun. It's packed with great content and tips from the guys who know their stuff, hopefully, a lot of the time. Or at least we discuss things. Um, I've seen firsthand how good their work is. Jonathan, that's really nice. Thank you very much for that review. So if you want to find the show notes for this episode, which is episode 35, you can go to ratherinventive.com slash podcast and look for episode 35 there. You can also send in your business marketing or creativity questions for our next episode as a tweet to at ratherinventive or you can email hello at ratherinventive.com and remember to uh, visit our sponsor which is inventivepeople.co.uk. You can get 20% off with your first order by using the code inventive podcast. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, um, Sarah, for joining us and we'll see you Thank next you. time. Bye-bye.